Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Taft City Council Successor Agency Joint Regular Meeting for Tuesday, September the 17th, 2019, here in the one and only Oil Dorado Room of the City of Taft. As a courtesy at all, please silence your cell phones, put them on vibrate. And even though we're here, any writings or documents provided to a majority of the City Council regarding any item on this agenda are made available for public inspection in the lobby at the Taft Transit Center, 550 Supply Road, Taft, California, during normal business hours. We're going to begin this evening's meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance led by Councilman Ed Whiting, followed by an invocation from Stephen McDaniel, the Revival Workshop Center. If you will join us, please. Ready to face the flag, please. Salute and pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Father, we love you, we appreciate you, we thank you for your blessings upon this day and upon our city. We pray over this meeting tonight, and, and Lord, I just pray a special prayer, special anointing over each and every one of our council members, over all the business that they are conducting here tonight. We pray that you, that we would have your wisdom, wisdom beyond our years and beyond our abilities, your wisdom, Lord. We pray, God, that it, everything would be done according to your will and according to your favor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. <clears throat> Madam Clerk, may we have a roll call, please? Mayor Knorr. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Cryer. Here. Council Member Bryant. Here. Council Member Evelyn. Here. And Council Member Whiting. Here. All right, first item on this evening's agenda is public hearing on costs and placement of liens on abated properties. Recommendation is to conduct a hearing regarding the statement of expense and then motions to adopt resolutions. So at this time, I will open the public hearing regarding these resolutions and ask that anybody who wishes to speak in support of or opposition to these resolutions, please step forward. Hearing none. I'll close the public hearing. At this time, I would entertain a motion to adopt resolutions entitled a resolution of the City Council of the City of Taft approving and confirming the cost for the abatement of the nuisance at 323 Lucard Street, Taft, California, APN number 031-140-04-9 in the amount of $857.80. A resolution of the City Council of the City of Taft approving and confirming the cost for the abatement of the nuisance at 407 6th Street, Taft, California, APN number 032-136-10-3 in the amount of $1,141.30. A resolution of the City Council of the City of Taft approving and confirming the cost for the abatement of the nuisance at 429 Center Street, Taft, California, APN number 031-040-01-7 in the amount of $129.30. A resolution of the City Council of the City of Taft approving and confirming the cost for the abatement of the nuisance at 609 Woodrow Street, Taft, California. APN number 031-350-08-5 in the amount of $827.96. And a resolution of the City Council of the City of Taft approving and confirming the cost for the abatement of the nuisance at 711 North Street, Taft, California, APN number 031-220-21-3 in the amount of $573.80. So moved. A second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion regarding these? I just would like to say thank you to code enforcement and the staff for being proactive. Uh, it's very important that we continue to abate these, and despite the facts that the property owners won't do it themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Mm -hmm. Councilman Eden. Nothing additional, sir. All right. <clears throat> Councilman Whiting. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I was asking <laughs> for a comment. During the discussion. No, no comments. No comment. Josh Cobb. Mayor Pro Tem Cryer. No comment. No comment. It is a shame that we have to go to these lengths to uh, keep things clean and safe in the city when people own property. You would think anybody fortunate enough to own property anywhere in the United States 
especially the city of Taft, would take pride in what they do and look after other people's safety as well. Uh, but that is not the case, so we have to go in there and we have to take care of these issues. We don't want to have to do this with public time and effort, but we do it because that's part of what a city does. So, um, I have a motion and a second. May we have a roll call, please? Mayor Pro Tem Cryer? Yes. Council Member Bryant? Yes. Council Member Evelyn? Yes. Council Member Whiting? Yes. And Mayor Knorr? Yes. Now pass on a 5 0 vote. Thank you very much. Next up, item number two presentation. Carla Hutcherson from the U.S. Census Bureau. She's not here. I don't think Carla made it this evening. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to shorten things up quite a bit. We'll move on. <laughs> Item number three, citizens request public comments. It would appear you all are here to listen and not speak this evening. So <laughs> we don't have to do that. I'm not even going to read that portion of it. Next up, council statements, non-action. Councilman Evelyn, I'm going to begin with you this evening, sir. Uh, no statements tonight, Mr. Mayor. All right. Thank you very much. Councilman Bryant. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I think a lot of folks had the unfortunate, I wouldn't call it a pleasure, but the distinction of having to watch a video of a man sat in front of this Bakersfield City Council last week or the week prior to talk about their frustration with the mounting uh, issues related to homelessness and drug abuse specifically. And I think he can speak for any one of us that would put ourselves in that same boat today. There's not a single person that can honestly look themselves in the mirror and say that they feel safer or more secure as a result of the Safe Schools and Safe Neighborhoods Act of 2014. Uh, what I would like to do is remind folks, or to at least advise folks, that there is an initiative that should be on the 2020 ballot uh, called the Reducing Crime and Keeping California Safe Initiative of 2020. Take a look at keepcalsafe.org to find a little bit more information. And I believe that the, uh, the district attorney, along with the, the Kern County Sheriff's Office and I'm sure other local uh, law enforcement agencies will be supporting as they get to know more and more of. So again, please take a look at that, keepcalsafe.org. And that's all I have tonight, Mr. Mayor. Thank, Thank you. you very much, sir. Councilman Whiting. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, as most of you noticed, I don't tend to make too many city council statements. I will, if asked, uh, comment on other matters before the council. But for the most part, I don't make too many statements. I've been a police officer all my life, uh, starting at age 18. I'm 61 years old today, and that's a long time. As you know, I came up through the ranks, worked thousands of drug cases, participated in many law enforcement related committees and organizations, but I also worked corrections. So did the current chief and I. In fact, uh, he and the previous chief, his father, we all worked corrections. Um, I've talked to literally thousands of criminals in and out of prison over my long law enforcement career, and I know them well. I'm by no means an expert, but I do know a criminal when I see them, and I know a crime when I see it. You see, there's a big difference between a homeless person and a drug or alcohol addict. The only similarity is that they are homeless, and that's where the similarities stop. A true homeless person is the one who lost their job through a variety of reasons, layoffs, terminations, personal reasons, got divorced and or lost their job, moved here with no other family members to support them, no friends, whatever it may be. But the key is they don't do drugs and alcohol. They're just trying to survive, and they truly need our support. Of the two groups, the homeless group is the smallest group by far. By far the largest segment is the drug or alcohol abuser. They lie, they cheat, they steal to support their habit. They no longer have a family to support them because they've destroyed that relationship. And they have no friends because they've destroyed that relationship too. They're homeless because they want to be. And all the money they can scrounge goes to drugs or alcohol. I mean, why spend money on rent when you can buy drugs and alcohol with it? Let's not forget the drug use and alcoholism drive almost all of our mental health issues that we see today. Yet this state has falsely labeled drug users and alcoholics as having a medical condition, a disease, if you will. I don't know about the rest of you, but when I have a medical malady or caught the flu or a, had a bad toothache, I didn't get it that way by purchasing it from my local drug dealer with cash or stolen property and then get treated at taxpayer expense. But that's exactly what we're doing. Drug and alcohol abusers certainly need help. And because we're compassionate people, we want to feed and clothe them. It's the Christian thing to do, and I get it. But do not tell me that we're helping them because that's an outright lie. There is a difference between a hand up and a hand out. True homeless people need help and they appreciate it. For the true homeless person, it's a hand up. Drug and alcohol users take whatever they can get, keep on using the drugs or alcohol. For them, it's a hand out, one that enables them to support their particular criminal habit. Now, the city of Taft didn't make this mess. Democrats did, who control the state of California. The good people, the taxpayers, they are fed up and they're mad and they want it to stop. 
When you look at the big and small cities around the state, no one seems to have an answer. That's because the answer is simple. Any thinking American should be able to grasp it. Until we recognize the difference between a true homeless person and a criminal drug or alcohol addict, we'll never be able to come to grips with a solution. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Amen. Mayor Pro Tem. Well said. Thank you, Mayor. Right. Uh, talking about wine, excellent. Uh, we had a say there. I agree with it totally. Uh, there's only like 20% of the people or uh, of the run around town uh, cause a lot of issues that are actually truly homeless. About 20%. It could be, it could be debatable, debatable and stuff, but most of them are, on, uh, like you said, uh, are drug users out there stealing, support their habits, uh, running around uh, causing issues with uh, the, the taxpayers here, the citizens here. At, uh, trying to have an honest living and uh, to transport their families and their children going to school and they're out there making it hard for the rest of us. Um, I know there's an issue here with all the council members here about the problems we have here in town and our county and, and across our uh, great state of California. But in uh, Sunday's paper, uh, you see as an article in the paper where there, our uh, DA with our Sheriff Youngblood um, come up with ideas and plans. And they have a good idea and plans, but it costs money. They have, they have a, a prison there that can support 650 beds that can uh, help get a lot of the, the ones that really truly need, you know, are on drugs, get them off the streets where they can go ahead and get themselves cleaned up, drug free, and they have an option. They can't force them, go to a rehab place, get off the drugs completely, and start a new life, opportunity to start a new life. And Right now, uh, it's not going to happen until they get funding. And I think we all, as uh, citizens of our great county here, is to see what can we do with our supervisors and stuff, get them funding to our sheriff, to see if we can go ahead and uh, help them get all the, uh, the criminal element, the vagrants, and, uh, and let the cooperative help the homeless part of it, but get the criminals off the streets so we can go ahead and live a civilized life here in our town and our county. And hopefully, it would be the catalyst for the rest of the counties in our state to follow. And uh, that, that's something that we need to do. And I think that uh, the council would, and the people here would help support that. And that's all I have to say on that matter. Um, the, other, the other one I would have to say is that this Thursday, if you all can, the, the half fort is having an oaky dinner. Uh, we're having catfish and chicken with all the fixing and stuff. It's something different, something new. And uh, so far we've got about 80 people so far reserved. We can use a few more to help support the fort and the fundraising to keep the fort alive. Uh, the repairs on that fort is expensive. And uh, it, it, if we don't continue keeping the fort, uh, pay, keep the bills and repair the, the fort, it's not gonna be there another 100 years. It won't last as long, but I encourage all the citizens to go ahead and come to our fort and, uh, and visit. And, um, and have a good time. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. The discussion about vagrancy and homelessness is in the front page. It has been for quite some time, and it mm -hmm. continues to be. Why? Because it's getting worse. Because everything that comes out of Sacramento exacerbates an existing problem. Because we take handcuffs off the of felons, and we put handcuffs on police officers. It's not going to go away. There's a great program that actually it was Councilman Whiting that uh, sent it to me, this wonderful link. This program <coughs> is from KOMO News, and the program is called Seattle is Dying, and it is well worth your one-hour watch. I've watched it a couple of times. I'll watch it again. The same policies that are in place in the state of California are in place in Seattle. Right now, of the 20 worst cities in the United States of America regarding uh, property crimes per 100,000. Seattle is number two in the United States. Number one, by a shot, is San Francisco. Number one. They figure right now in the city of Seattle, they spend annually combating the vagrancy issues and the cleanups and everything that go with them. The city of Seattle spends about a billion dollars a year on a problem that continues to grow worse. A billion dollars a year. 
But there's other places that haven't figured out. This, this uh, wheel has been invented. We needn't reinvent this wheel. All we need to do is learn from others. <coughs> so I would encourage each and every one of you to look it up. I'm telling you, it's worth your time to truly understand what's going on out there. The cost, the cost to human dignity. Uh, it's, it's shocking. Seattle is dying. And California, parts of California, is ahead of it. So take the time and get educated about this issue. It's, it's big and it will only get bigger. And on a different note, a couple of Friday nights ago, we had an incredible football game here in the city of Taft. And it was the night that we honored the men and women who served this country, veterans and active duty military personnel. And man, were there a lot of flags around the football stadium. Mm -hmm. The biggest flags around were flying all around Taft Stadium. The warriors from Tehachapi came down to play football and they put up a heck of a fight, but uh, the Wildcats prevailed that night, and we we're all happy about that. <laughs> but it was followed by an article, an article that was written and published in the Tehachapi newspaper. And it was a fabulous article. And uh, who was it that wrote that? The assistant Corey city Cussell. manager? Mm -hmm. uh, he wrote the article, and he talked about not just the football game, he talked about his trip here, he talked about the city of Taft, he talked about the way the field looked, which, by the way, all of that artwork on the field is done freehand by a student. Uh, it's a staff member. Staff member, yeah. I'm sorry. Freehand did all of that, and it looked, it looked wonderful. And yeah, it looked good. The, the article that I read that was published in Tatchpee Paper was a breath of fresh air. It was a, it was a wonderful article, and it was very positive uh, about the city, about the people of the city of Tatchpee, about the football game, and about the veterans, and about the fact that we took the time to honor them. So... Uh, I want to thank him publicly, and I'm going to send him a letter thanking him officially for his observations and, and uh, for the way that whole night went. Anyway, it was a great night. That is all I have this evening. Planning Commission reports. Do we have a Planning Commission report this evening? No Planning Commission report. Okay, how about Department reports? Do we have any Department reports this evening? None. City Manager statements. Do we have any City Manager statements? <laughs> No statement this evening. Thank so you. you just made a statement that city manager is not here this evening. Okay. All right then. City attorney statements. No, thank you, sir. Welcome back. By the way, we missed you. Thank you very much. Future agenda requests this evening, gentlemen. None. Okay then. We're going to move on to consent calendar items ten through twelve. All items listed on the consent calendar shall be considered routine and will be enacted by one roll call vote. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the city council re requests specific items to be removed from the consent calendar for separate action. Any item removed from the consent calendar will be considered after the regular business items. Are there any items on the consent calendar that any member of the public would like to comment on? Seeing none. Consent calendar items 10 through 12. Item number 10 would be the minutes of the September 3rd, 2019 regular meeting. Item number 11 would be the payment of bills, about uh, $490,000 worth. And item number 12 would be consider resolutions for League of California Cities annual conference and authorize voting delegate to vote accordingly, which, by the way, I'm going to remove that from the consent calendar for further discussion. So does any member of the council wish to remo remove any other items from the consent calendar? Hearing none, at this time, I would, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I would consider a uh, motion. A motion. motion. <laughs> My goodness. Motion. Uh, 60 years old, guy forgets everything. Uh, I would entertain a motion for to approve consent calendar items 10 and 11. So motion. moved. Second. Motion second. Thank goodness you guys didn't forget your position. All right. I have a motion a second. May I have a roll call, please? Mayor Pro Tem Cryer? Yes. Council Member Bryant? Yes. Council Member Evelyn? Yes. Council Member Whiting? Yes. And Mayor Knorr? Yes. Thank you. It's approved on 5 0 vote. That brings us to item number 12. Consider resolutions for League of California Cities annual conference and authorize voting delegate to vote accordingly. See Manager Lon Boyer. The 2019 League of California Cities Annual Conference is scheduled for October 16th through October 18th, 2019. At the July 2nd Council meeting, 
council approved expenses for council member Bryant and mayor pro tem crier to attend the conference. They nominated council member Bryant to serve as the voting delegate for the city of Taft with mayor pro tem crier serving as an alternate. We are now in receipt of the resolutions. Council is encouraged to determine a city position so that council member Bryant can represent the city's position on the resolutions. Thank you very much, sir. Recommend action here is to consider the resolutions provided by the League of California Cities and determine the city's position. And then a motion to authorize the city of Taft authorized delegate to vote according to the city's determined position on these resolutions. So we have two resolutions that are going to be coming before the League of California Cities, gentlemen. And this is a time for us to discuss our position on these uh, resolutions. So uh, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll kick these things off. The first resolution is resolution number one, and the background, let's see, background is Rancho Palos Verdes is the most populated California city to have 90% or more of residents living in a CAL FIRE designated very high fire hazard severity zone. Over the years, the Palos Verdes Peninsula has been numerous brush fires that was determined to be caused by electrical utility equipment. Across the state, some of the most destructive and deadly wildfires were sparked by power equipment. But when it comes to undergrounding overhead utilities, fire safety is not taken into account when considering using taxpayer funds to pay for those projects under California's Electric Tariff Rule 20 program. The program was largely intended to address visual blights when it was implemented in 1967. Under Rule 20A, utilities must allocate ratepayer funds to undergrounding conversion projects chosen by local governments to have a public benefit and meet one or more of the following criteria, which is eliminate an unusually heavy concentration of overhead lines, involve a street or road with a high volume of public traffic, benefit a civic or public recreation area or area of unusual scenic interest, and be listed as an arterial street or major collector as defined in the Governor's Office of Planning and Research guidelines. So I don't want to have to read this whole thing to everybody, but I'm sure you all have gone through and read this as well as the League's stance on this. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to kick this off and they had letters of uh, concurrence from 11 different cities. Uh, just so everybody out there knows that yeah, 20A, Rule 20A, does not prescribe a way to use those funds, ratepayer funds, to underground utilities. But it wasn't meant to. It was meant to eliminate visual blight. There is a rule, 20D, that is a part of this. And it is meant for the undergrounding of utilities based on a fire hazard and extreme fire hazard areas. The interesting thing about 20D is it is confined to the San Diego uh, gas and electric area because of the fires that San Diego experienced in 2007, and they're very destructive. So in January, I believe of 2014, they passed rule 20D so that they could use ratepayer funds for undergrounding of utilities in the high fire hazard areas. Here's what I find very interesting. The league supports a stance to include the elimination of overhead power in 20A, which 20A is meant to deal with blight, visual blight. It's not meant to deal with fire hazards. 20D is. The only problem with 20D is that it's confined to San Diego gas and electric area and not the rest of the state. Well, this is typical government. So what we want to do is we want to take an area that's being underused and instead of modifying 20D to include all of PG&E's areas or all of the high fire areas in the state of California, because that's what it's there for, we want to include the fire hazard in 20A, which is a visual blight. That makes no sense to me. The other thing that makes no sense to me is if you read the 11 letters of support from all the different cities, signed by the different mayors and city managers, 10 out of 11 are plagiarized, almost verbatim, a couple of little differences. Only one of the 11 addresses the fact that 20D exists 
And we can modify 20D to include the undergrounding of overhead power, but throughout the state, as opposed to including it in the visual blight 20A rule. So just to start the discussion, that makes no sense to me. It doesn't. It's like saying, well, the fire department has been working a lot of overtime, but TAP-PD hasn't. So let's require TAP-PD to carry axes and, and carry rollouts and fire extinguishers, and, and that way they can help out the fire department. Yeah. It makes no sense to me. Well, so with that, I'll, 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 I'll leave it out there on the table. You know, it's very hard to argue with that, and you articulated that very well, so I'm glad you said it. I guess my question would be more, do we reject or cumulatively vote to reject this particular resolution and then uh, propose an alternative resolution that deals with the piece on 20D? Well, by the rules of order at uh, the League of California Cities, you can ask the committee that there be discussion on this item. So it can be removed and discussed. Quite frankly, they can, if enough of them say no, they don't have to. That's a problem. But I would ask that it be discussed discuss these points that we're talking about. And here's the other issue that I have, finally, and that is with 20D, remember they had these terrible fires in 2007 in San Diego. It took seven years to pass 20D so that they would be a mechanism to deal with the undergrounding of power in high fire hazard areas. Do you know how many programs, how many projects have been completed in the San Diego area since they passed this in January of 2014? I'll help you out. None. None. <laughs> Zero. It was so important after the fires in 2007 that they passed Rule 20D and formulated Rule 20D, and they haven't done a thing with it. Not only have they not done a single project, there are none on the books. There are none on the drawing board. Okay. So uh, another question would be, sir, if they passed the rule and they made the Rule 20D specifically for the San Diego high fire hazard area, why is it that after five and a half years, they haven't done a single thing with it? Or is there a problem with the way it was written or funded such that it needs to be reconsidered and then add the rest of the state into 20D so it's effective and it covers the rest of the state as opposed to turning a rule that was meant to eliminate visual blight into one to eliminate uh, overhead power because of a fire hazard. Does any of that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah, what they're doing doesn't. It's I would encourage additional discussion, but as long as everybody understands where I'm coming from. No, absolutely. The question I have for Councilman Bryant is, if that's a uh, big city <coughs> of our district, who are the pulse of the other cities discussing this? You're a representative for League of Cities, so <laughs> I was not there. I thought you were a representative. Nope. You are the representative for League of Cities, my understanding. And I misunderstood, and I'm in this in the meeting center. I believe I'm the alternate for League of Cities. Okay. Um, even uh, even layman reading, it's it's square peg round hole. It, it I, doesn't I make a, that is. a heck of a lot of sense. In answer to, to your it. question, it would appear these eleven cities, councilmen, all support the league stance. Yeah. But one of them, uh, I think it's Malibu. I believe it was the mayor of Malibu said, uh, "Hey, you know there is this rule twenty D. Perhaps we ought to consider modification yeah. of twenty D." And well, let's see here. Yeah, I, I believe it was Malibu. I'm sorry, I don't have that right offhand. But it, as I read through the 11 of them, I believe that one stood out. No. Well, I did look at through those. A lot of the, I didn't see anything from the ballot. And nobody was represented in terms of uh, their letter of support or even against it from the ballot. So I wasn't sure what the pulse was from even the central section. Mm -hmm. I mean, but it makes you sense. can see as you read every one of these, there's there's a lot of boilerplate language in every one of these, and they've all taken advantage of. The premise seems to make sense. At the end of the day, we've had a, say, a litany of fires, especially in high fire areas, and the state of California is doing less and less to mitigate those issues in those areas. So this is intended to underground and create less opportunity for fires to happen. But just like you said, Mr. Mayor, is there something built into the one that's already there for San Diego right. that's prohibiting those mitigations from happening? Or is there a lack of need? Has it been luck? What's it been? That's the question. Well, then we'll be happy to ask that. It would, it would be then, uh, if, if everybody concurs, it would be my suggestion that the direction of this council to its voting delegate would be to remove this and discuss this item based on the information that we're discussing right now. And I would think that the resolution 
should be modified to say that you ought to modify 20D to include the rest of the high fire hazard areas in the state of California in 20D and also examine the problem with 20D regarding why they haven't done anything with it. Hmm. Nothing since January of 2014. Mr. Mayor, I have a question and, a, and an observation. The sir. question is 20D was designed at ratepayers expense? That is correct, sir. All of this is. So I'm just going to I'm just going to take a, uh, thing. A, a shot from the dark here, if you will. So in the last five years, they've done nothing because I suspect based on all the overregulation here in California that it would take five years to even try to think about getting it on the drawing board, considering all the rules that CEQA uh, concerns there and and how much CEQA changes every year. And I'm thinking even if they could, they can't because PG&E doesn't have the money to do it now since they let a whole town go away based on a fire they started. Well, of course, down there, that's San Diego Gas and Electric. That's not PG&E. So San Diego Gas and Electric has not. I agree with you regarding getting permitting with the Endangered Species Act and CEQA and all of that. The other thing on the money side that we have to consider is in rural California, undergrounding of overhead power is about 93000 bucks a mile. In a municipality, it can run five million dollars a mile. Wow. So do the math. That's oh, an awful sure lot of money. Yeah. But something needs to change, I agree with you, because the way they're doing it now it's not working. It's so ridiculous. Do we have concurrence regarding direction to the voting delegate? I apologize, Mr. Mayor. One more question. You obviously reviewed it more than me. So during this entire time, twenty D has existed. It was on ratepayers and nothing nothing has been done Correct. since then. But that money has been continuously collected in order to do that, but not appropriately spent as D would have suggested. That's a very good question. One that would be posed to San Diego Gas and Electric. Sounds because like rebate the mechanism time. was approved. Right. Another good question. Thank you. How do you say rebate? Yeah. No. <laughs> Should be. I don't understand, I understand that new construction that the law says, or I believe it is, that uh, has to be underground in new construction area, but not in. Area that in, uh, in the older areas, you don't have to do that. Well, well, new construction is an entirely different model. Typically, new construction undergrounding of utilities is taken on by the developer. This is the undergrounding of existing overhead utilities based on the fire danger it, that it poses uh, in extreme high fire hazard areas. Yeah. Um, I said, I'm, I'm, there's so many different um, Chile districts. You have the IID in, in Imperial Valley area and Coachella Valley. I know San Diego has that area for that district, and there's so many different um, uh, districts for different uh, utilities. And PG has, like, we're in a PG in area, and there's Southern California. Uh, there's different uh, uh, utility stuff, but uh, each one has a, uh, it'd be interesting to find out what the rules and regulations for each area, but. Right now, they're talking about the uh, San Diego area. For well, this this rule, the rule twenty, is statewide to expand it to statewide. State. So, so the consideration here is, yeah, they want to expand rule twenty a. Twenty a is the elimination of visual blight and I concur through underground. I concur. What do you say about? All right. Doing that? Thank you very much. Does everybody concur then? <coughs> Absolutely. Yes, good. All right. Thank you very much. All right. We have a direction. Very good then. <laughs> Let's go on to the second item that you're going to consider down there, which is somewhat of a disgusting thing when you read about it. Uh, and that is uh, raw pollution making its way <coughs> across the border into the state of California from rivers and waters that originate south of the border. Um, I have another observation, and, and Harry. We're open for discussion, and as the reason for uh, the raw pollution making its way into those rivers and then finally into the state of California and emptying into the ocean and shutting down <coughs> 800 days over the course of five years, was if you look back in history, NAFTA is what the opportunity was for employment south of the border, all right? And after NAFTA, you saw a lot of manufacturing jobs go south of the border and take advantage of uh, the availability of cheap labor in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And so there's a great deal of development down there. 
a lot of people moved into those areas just across the border, and a lot of those people went to work. And there was a great deal of money made down there. However, that money was not invested in infrastructure, waste, wastewater treatment facilities or the like. So uh, those facilities have degraded. They weren't run correctly. And the result of that is raw sewage and pollutants into those rivers that flow into the state of California or out into the ocean and affect the beaches. Now, the league is asking for the federal government to reinstitute the funds that they had to deal with those things on a multinational basis. That means money from the United States of America and money from Mexico to deal with this issue. In the beginning, prior to NAFTA, it was $100 million a year, and then it got down to $10 million. But it is uh, to be eliminated in a proposed federal budget uh, based on the current administration. A lot of what is said in the League of California City stance on this is asking that that $10 million be put back in the budget or more. But I don't see a great deal of rhetoric on the part of the league stance regarding the fact that all of this is originating where? Mexico. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It's originating in Mexico. Uh, we have agreements with our neighbors south of the border, and those agreements are part of what moved that economic viability down there. Um, it, it would appear they're not nearly as concerned about the environment or uh, you know people's quality of life downstream as we are, and they're not doing their part. Uh, if it were me, I would go to them and say, you guys have a real problem on your hands. And if they say we don't have the funds, then more than likely the funds will have to come from the United States in the form of a loan, and they will have to pay interest on that, whether uh, the interest is paid automatically in the form of tariffs for goods coming back to the United States or whatever. But obviously the, the overall negative effects are being felt by people in the state of California and the lower states along our southern border, uh, more so than they are the people who are doing the polluting. Right. Um, Mr. Mayor, my, on that, but Back when they passed NAFTA, when the whole free trade agreement opened up, one of the things that's not really addressed, or I didn't see it addressed, and there was a the fact that Mexico made an incredible amount of money during that time as well. Absolutely. They Absolutely. failed on their end, as long as corporations, along with the corporations moving down to that area, to properly, uh, at least by our standards, to properly account for some of the facilities that should have went in at the time to deal with this kind of thing. But that money was there. That money was there for up, up until now it was there. So they made an incredible amount of money, but nothing was done. And all of a sudden, just my opinion, all of a sudden it's our problem that that was all done down there. So I agree. The first treaty, I believe, was in 1944 regarding yep. this issue. And then subsequent to that, 67. And uh, But I agree with you. I do indeed. My, my experience down here, I've uh, been farming that area there for about 43 years and still to this day. Um, the Colorado River, we had to give a percentage of that to Mexico. What we do to Mexico, we have a desalination plant right on the border there, and the, the water is cleaned up and sent to Mexico. We pay for it. Our taxpayer money pay for all that. And then we get the water that's got salt in it, and it goes in the fields, and you have uh, tiles out there, and it leaches in there, and it goes in the salt and sea. There's two rivers there that goes through that area from Mexicali, uh, called the New River mm -hmm. and the Alamo. And all that goes to the Salton Sea. And uh, there's contamination, they're getting algae, and they're getting all kinds of stuff and, uh, from that. <clears throat> and those rivers, I know very well, because they go through our fields. I, I can see them going right, right in there. And they're full of trash, you can see diapers, you can see poop, you can see everything in that water that comes right through the, right from Mexico in there. And uh, the, the sediment for the people and the citizens in that area there Damn the river, you know, build a wall, damn the river, but uh, that's not gonna, they're not gonna, not gonna happen. And there are pesticides and oh, chemicals yeah. and everything beyond visual pollutants. The, well, in that area there, they live on, they live on the river area and they do a lot of weird things there. But anyway, uh, that's an issue they have there. So um, I, I, I'm definitely affected with the prop that we have there we rent from and the growers and stuff that from all that from Mexico. And I just wanna just, just say that. Uh, that's that first time. Thank you. So one way or the other, this water is flowing in the United States, and we don't have any real way to stop it outside of damming it, right? Yeah. We're the ones who are ultimately realizing the environmental impacts, 
and the other impacts, whether that water is used for irrigation and whatnot, it's onto American soil. I like the idea of suggesting some type of tariff to help repay debt service and or in the overall cost, whatever that might be. If, but we know that those waters are not originating on our, you know, on our behalf. But at the end of the day, we're we're the ones stuck holding the bag. And it, everybody knows that the costs associated with cleaning up a polluted river is far more expensive than putting in facilities to avoid the pollution at the source. What I'd be curious about is right now today, what are we doing to depollute that? What are the costs associated with that? Why are we not billing those back to the source? It's not going to happen. Good question. It's, it's, it's not going to happen by Mexico, so I can tell you that. But a river cross in from Mexico into the, it's very highly populated on our side of the world. That's the New River, right? The river and, and the Alamo. Okay. But uh, it's, it's, we're going to put it at. It's got to be out in, uh, it's going to be away from the border. It's got to be away from the border. Or let's say go ahead and gravitate in a different location, change the river course to go to another area. Well, I don't think they're going to change the river course, but somewhere upstream, they are pour, pouring millions of uh, gallons of untreated sewage into been, these rivers. The people there have been complaining about that for many, many years about that, and uh, maybe finally they'll get some result. Okay, well, here you have the League of California Cities saying, we as California and we as the cities of California need to petition the federal government mm -hmm. to put American taxpayers' dollars back into the federal budget to deal with this problem. But I don't see a great deal of discussion regarding the responsibility of those that are guilty of the pollution. I don't see that. So, I don't know. With the current administration, I mean, you can pass that resolution and that suggestion all you want, but based on what I know about the source and, and the people in Washington right now, I don't know that that resolution is going to do diddly. If you're going to have a suggestion and a business plan that actually will support the elimination of the source before it gets in the water, as opposed to spending American taxpayers' dollars on trying to clean up a flowing, polluted river, okay, then, then maybe you're going to get somewhere. So, a here again, um, including this. You know. So, what type of options would we have to, to ultimately get it at the source, as opposed to dealing with it after the fact? Uh, that, with that type of care for some type of fiscal punishment so we, if you don't do this then x we currently have multinational treaties with mexico regarding this very issue you know with with transnational waters we we have these they are not living up to uh, their part of the bargain they're not doing it and uh, you have to sit down with them and let them know they're not doing it and it's a lot less expensive to clean up the problem and avoid putting in a river than it is to clean up a whole doggone river that's where the federal government comes in. Good. I think we need to at least find out if they've got the data that supports what our costs are today to utilize that or to clean that water and start there and say, okay, well, this is the initial bargaining chip. It can be a heck of a lot cheaper, and you still are going to pay for this if you do X. I, I would agree. And, and if, in order just to, I don't know, make a statement or get it in front of uh, the federal government's eyes, they want to pass this resolution and send it upward. Uh, I guess that's one thing, but... If you want to bring something to their attention, why not go to the table with a solution? Absolutely. This is just us imploring us, hey, we need to spend more American dollars to do what we're already doing anyway. That's exactly right. And perhaps the reason it's being eliminated from the budget is because it was money that was not having uh, any beneficial effect. I, I just don't know. So, well, now we know. continue to be the process. If we don't stop the source of whatever's going on, why are we? It's This is just feel good to That's me. Correct. I mean, That's in correct. my opinion. I agree wholeheartedly. That's right. Any additional discussion, gentlemen? So, what do you think, Josh? At the end of the day, we can vote no, and we're still going to have to deal with the after effects. Mm -hmm. We can vote yes, and we're going to deal with the after effects in this manner anyway. Uh, so, if we want to take a stand and say, hey, at the end of the day, we need to come back with a real solution, I'd be happy to vote no on that. Right. I, I would agree. agree. If, uh, if the rest of the league wants to just blindly rubber stamp it and send it up there saying we want our money back uh, without recognizing the real problem, uh, why be a part of that? This is no different than what we're doing in California today, saying homelessness is a problem, homelessness is a problem, but we don't rec recognize the underlying issue. I agree. I agree. I agree as well. All right. Everybody comfortable with that? Comfortable. All right. You comfortable with the direction then, Council? Yes, sir. Absolutely. All right. Very good then. <clears throat> so, to remind everybody, our recommended action was consider the resolution provided by the League of California Cities and determine our position, I believe. We've had some very constructive discussion mm -hmm. regarding that. 
A motion to authorize the City of Tap authorized delegate to vote according to the City's determined position on the resolutions. At this time, I would entertain such a motion. Motion. Second. second. I have a motion Mayor. and a second. Can we have roll call, please? Mayor Pro Tem Cryer? Yes. Council Member Bryant? Yes. Council Member Evelyn? Yes. Council Member Whiting? Yes. Uh, Mayor Nor. Yes. And that pass on a 5 0 vote. Thank you very much for the discussion, gentlemen. It is my sincere pleasure to call for a motion to adjourn without closed session item. So moved. <laughs> and a second. Motion. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 This meeting is adjourned. Thanks for being a part. I can't believe we're not having a closed session meeting. I'm glad you brought up the 20.